Is it on? Oh, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Uh, morning, saints. Uh, let me offer a word of prayer. Thank you for all of those that can make it here. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness, your loving kindness, and your mercy that you have toward us. Lord, we've been going through a lot these past few months, and then there's still greater uh, trials and tribulations ahead, but you have always blessed us and kept us from the evil. We ask that you continue to do that. And we pray for those on the uh, prayer request list and those that are sick and shed in, those that are traveling, and those that can't make it be with us. Bless each household represented and those that are to come. We ask this, we open up thy word. Give us a deeper understanding so that we may draw closer to you and to know you and the message you have for us this time. We ask these mercy in your dear son's name. And for his sake we pray. Amen. Again, we've come under the feet of the master teacher who is ready to teach us. And the memory text says that, then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus Christ on the way. Have you been with Jesus Christ of late? Even just now? Is Jesus telling you that you have received your sight because of your faith and asking you to go on your way? If we are still not ashamed of ourselves that we are sinners and we need Jesus Christ, this is the time. This is the hour that we need to come under the feet of Jesus Christ as Jacob did on his way when he was running from his brother and slept on the stone and saw the angels ascending and descending from heaven. Where can we run to that Jesus cannot see us? There is no hiding place anywhere. Even if we want to go in the cave, Christ is already there before us. Under the sea, oh man, you have to remember that he was the one who was able to tell the sea to be still. And it was done. So there is no hiding place for us as Adam and Eve were trying to hide from the face of Jesus Christ for eating the forbidden uh, fruits. And God declared that I can be the measure of my own life. I, I can be God to myself. I have authority over the word of God. There is nothing that we can do, that Christ don't know. And if we come, the rabbi Jesus was there in the Garden of Eden personally, telling them that they need to come to him. And now he's telling us to come to him and be the follower of Jesus Christ. But there is something that we need to talk about. And I'm sure we all, by the end of the lesson, we will get to know something out of this. For from within our, out of or the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, envy, slander, pride, 
Foolishness. If he talks about foolishness, what is he talking about? All this that he's saying come from within. It start. Everything started very good. If you read Genesis 1, 31. And then come the forbidden fruit eating. Genesis 3, 6. Hiding and blaming. I'm, I'm the first among the lot. That if you do something, you want to justify what you've done. But we cannot change God. But God can change us. So hiding and blaming is not a good game. But we need to accept our faults. We need to accept our mistakes. We need to accept our sins. The evil that man do comes from the head. So then comes the Medra, Genesis 4, 8. The ricks of Medra and God's sevenfold vengeance. If we're going to work, if we know that the vengeance is there, sevenfold, we need to think about it. Then comes the murder, the uh, manslaughter, and call for 77-fold vengeance. From seven to 77. Then the global wickedness taught only continually evil. Genesis 6, 5. Our teacher is ready to facilitate the lesson study, so I'll give him the chance to do it for us now. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Happy Sabbath. Um, how you all been doing this week? Have a good week. Let me see where I'm at here. Let me get back to the lesson. How many of you have had a chance to study the lesson this week? Come on now. Come on now. It was actually pretty good. What we're talking about, what this whole quarter's lesson, it's education and the, uh, the classroom setting and the ultimate teacher who is not only our other brother, he's our savior. I want to read this. Let me get to it. I think it was, give me a second. Just one little quote. This is taken, this is from actually uh, the lesson from Friday, October 23rd. It says, the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. That's it. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. That's it, Derek. It's that simple. I can sit down now. <laughs> we, can, we can go into the 11 o'clock hour now. That's it. It's that simple. Let me get to the, to the lesson so we, we can touch on it. Just a little. All right, uh, let's look at us. Uh, Sabbath uh, lesson. And then uh, the lesson is redundant with these scriptures. We're going to read through them, but we're going to cover them later. But let's look at the memory text that the brother just quoted. And again, that comes up later. But it says,
sometimes when we run across Jesus in the hills, we can't go back the way we came. We got to follow him. And we do it naturally because of the work, the blessing that he gave us. So anyway, let me get back to that. Uh, it says, Hello, this is Grace online. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hi, this is Grace, and I'm online. I'd love to say something about that particular uh, verse. Hi, Grace. How you doing? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, what I like about that verse is Jesus um, saves um, the blind man, mm -hmm. but he also um, preserves the blind, blind man's freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, go your way. And what the blind man decided is he had found his way, and his way was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he used his freedom of choice to follow the way, wherever the way went. Amen. That was good. Uh, okay, go ahead. Well, I don't know if he spoke loud enough. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just interesting that Matthew, in the 20th chapter, says there were two blind men, and they both were healed by Jesus, and they both followed him. It's going to be interesting who was right, Mark or Matthew, right? Well, yeah, and when we got to that, because this comes up again later on in the lesson, that was one of the texts that I was bringing up. Go, go ahead. Well, that's it. I just wanted to. Yes. I was, you know, I was going through it, and I found out, wow, there were mm -hmm. actually two, by, by according to Matthew. Mm -hmm. There you go. It says, who among us has never been ashamed of himself or herself? That's a question. <laughs> who among us? Go ahead. A question, a comment on the uh, memory text. So it says your faith has made you well or healed you or hold. What does that mean? I mean, isn't it the power of God that makes, that heals? So what are we talking about when we say your faith has made you well? Is it simply believing that I'm going to be well? Or, or what are they talking about here? He believed in the power in his faith because Christ could have, couldn't do that without his faith. And he said, because you, it's the same way, remember the centurion who Christ met on the way? And he said, you don't even have to come. He said, speak the word only. And then what did Christ say? He said, I have never seen faith like that in Israel. Then, okay, to answer you another question, he said, if we had a faith the grain of a mustard seed, we could say unto this mountain be thou removed. Did he really mean that? Did he really mean that through our faith? And then let me give you one more. Remember they were out on the ocean mm -hmm. and uh, the, the storm came and everything. He was in there sleeping. He got up and he told him, where is your faith? What did he mean by that? I'm thinking maybe they could have spoke to the sea when it says even the winds in the sea obey him. I'm thinking they could have even did that. So to answer your question, my thing is we have that power. It's not our power. It's his power. But it takes our faith. And by doing that, he can work in us. So, so here's a question. Mm -hmm. we, we read in the, in the Bible our brother Paul, mm -hmm. who prayed to God multiple times about his con condition that he mm -hmm. had, yeah. right? And it was never resolved. And he was a man of faith, yeah. right? He had so, that thorn in his flesh. Yeah, yeah so, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking because you find sometimes there are people that are praying to God, praying to God for, for help. Mm -hmm. And what they are asking for never happens for them, right? Mm -hmm. So does that minimize this person's, uh, does it illustrate that their faith is less than it should be? Or is it saying something else about God and his timing, his purpose, and all of that, right? Because even when we read in the Bible, we see where there was a lot of people that was asking Jesus to do this and do that and do that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it didn't happen. You know, he passed by, you know, it was, the Bible said it was crowds around him all the time, trying to touch him or all these different things. But, they, but sometimes the things didn't happen. Okay. So well, is I, it, go ahead. Is it, is it um, that the, the faith is in the wrong thing 
or are they asking for something that may not be for them at the time? Um, because we know, as, as you said, it's not, the, the, it's not simply that we believe, it's the power of God working. And I think a it's lot of it has to do with- in the power of God. Yeah, that thing. I think it's a lot, has a lot to do with the timing because all, all these cases we see in the Bible, God already knew about this stuff way back before Jesus even came down. You know, he knew about these issues that was happening to, like the lady that, like the man who had been on, on his death in the sick bed for 38 years. Mm-hmm. God already knew about this guy, you know? Okay. But, but it, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't time. <clears throat> man, I think it could be a combination of all of that. It could be that individual. I mean, it's just the Bible. He said to other person, according to your faith, be it unto you. So some people, they might just because they act don't mean they have the faith. So I don't know, it could be a combination of all of that, but we gotta move on because, you know, we gotta, and it says- um, um, Can I say one more thing about that um, point? Uh, yeah. This is Grace online. Mm-hmm. I think part of the answer is in Mark 10, verses 47 and 48. Um, let me read that. And when he, the blind man, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mm-hmm. And when many warned him to be quiet, he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Mm-hmm. To me, that was a statement of faith. He knew that Jesus had a reputation of healing. He also knew that he was the son of David, which was another way of saying the promised one, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And he was confident that this Messiah would have, that was foretold, would have mercy on him. Mm -hmm. And mercy can come in many forms. Mercy can be just recognized of God that you're a sinner and you're forgiven, uh, which in that culture would have been uh, wonderful because um, many times people viewed blindness as a curse of um, uh, God. In fact, this gentleman was named son of uh, Bartimaeus. Uh, That means son of unclean. It was a Chaldean name. So I am thinking that people looked at him and said, oh, your daddy done wrong. He was unclean and you got cursed with this. Mm -hmm. It was a payment for your daddy's sin. So I think this blind man when he said, son of David, Jesus, Savior, you can save me from my sin and also heal me. So I think that's where the faith was. He had faith in the, who Jesus was. From the beginning. <laughs> he, from the beginning, because he knew of him before he even saw him, when he recognized that was him. He start calling for him. We need to do that. We're going down, it says, of course, thanks, Grace. Thanks. Of course, that's one reason the gospel is universal and Christ's death was for all humanity. Whatever our difference is surely one thing unites us, our general sinfulness. Hence, the true Christian education must be about pointing us to the only solution for our rather dismal state. This week, we'll look at our only solution our master teacher. Let's go to Sunday. Genesis 3, 1 through 11. Uh, I mean, you all know the account. We don't have to go through that. Uh, we, and the story went after, after the fall. We, we can, uh, because it's take of time, go into what was in Eve's thinking after she had the command, what was her thinking? Uh, one writer said that Eve was not deceived. She, and she didn't, or she didn't disbelieve God. She just chose to believe a lie of Satan. And that caused Adam, was Adam deceived? Adam knew fully well what had happened when Eve came to him? Adam made the choice that he would die with this woman to live with God forever. Think about that. Do we make that choice? Because we're faced with the same consequences sometimes. I've done it. I'm, <laughs> I've done it. 
Uh, this thing is blind. Let me give you this quote. It's in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, I believe what it is. Let me read it to you. I'm, I'm, let me quote it. You can look it up if you want. It says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost and whom the God of this world have blinded their minds. What does that mean? He blinded their minds so that the light of this glorious gospel cannot shine unto them. Satan has a way of doing that, and we have a way of allowing him to do it. David said, I'll put no evil before my eyes. All this stuff adds up. We do this to ourselves. We used to read earlier, we talk about others. He said, I'm standing at the door and knocking. He's still standing. Open the door. Open the door <laughs> and let me in. Well, I mean, so Adam did it. He made that choice when God could have made him another Eve. Couldn't he? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And I think Paul makes a comment that the woman being deceived was not in sin, right? So, so, so she, they could have went to God. But wait, why was she in sin? Because she was deceived. She, it, wasn't a, it wasn't rebellion on, on her part, like with Adam. Adam knew what he was doing and, it, and, and showed to do it anyway. He was or wrong. you could say she wasn't the head of humanity. Right, but... Adam was. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. they could have went to God and asked for forgiveness. But, you know, every time I read this story, so this, this lesson is about learning from the lessons that was given to us by God. And so when I, every time I read this, I, I always see something new in this lesson about the, the, the Garden of Eden event. And um, <clears throat> so th when I look at the tree, of, the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, and, and what happened there, and it wasn't about eating fruit. It wasn't about whether the fruit was bad or good. And we know that the, 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 the serpent never said that the fruit was toxic or that it would kill you, mm -hmm. right? The insinuation was not that the fruit was bad, but that God was bad. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, you find uh, when God shows up, they run and hide from him. Why? But had they seen something in God's character prior to make them, to make them afraid of his, his attitude toward them because of what they had done? I don't think so. The Bible says... It in, was in, guilt. Right. But even, even with that, the Bible says in, in, in um, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. And I'm sure he had displayed that love to them all the time. But now they're running to hide like uh, he does, uh, from him. Yeah. So, but you, you see that... And then you see this same concept in church today. We, we, we constantly try. In, church. in churches, all, Christianity, all together. Oh, my God. You, you, you find people <laughs> constantly trying to find ways to hide themselves from God. You know, they, 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 for some reason, they have this misconception of God that he's this mean guy. So they, they talk, and you, you'll hear these terms used, and how people understand it, I, I, I can't really say, but they start talking about hiding, hiding behind Jesus, you know, hiding behind the cross, finding, trying to find ways to hide from God. When God is asking, God, as it said in, in, in Genesis 3, God came to them looking for them. He wasn't upset, you know. He wasn't upset with them. He was hurt because they had put themselves in a bad situation, but he wasn't upset. Okay, I, okay. I, I mean... Now, Real quick, let me, let me finish this about, and I'll, I'll be done. Um, so, so when we, and, and you find this teaching out there, um, the once saved, always saved ideas, all, all these different things, where, where sin is not the problem, God becomes the problem. And people try and find ways, it, it's not about sin, it's about what God will do to you if you don't get rid of sin. That becomes the bigger issue with people, so they try to it's find ways, it, it, huh? It's sin. It's just, I, I, I know. <laughs> but the point is, when you have teachings out there like "once saved, always saved," you're saying that if I can do these particular things, then I can avoid God's wrath, and I can continue to live the way I want. So, so we try to find ways to um, to 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 get around God persecuting a, uh, us but mm -hmm. still allow us to live, our, live our, our, our same way, live that sinful life. So I think that, you know, and this is, this is the purpose, I believe, of the Adventist church, to have this right concept 
of God and his purpose and his way. This is, which, is, which is what Jesus did when he came. You know, came to show exact. You said it earlier. The true purpose of education is to restore the image of God in our minds uh, and in our character. So that's, I think that's our purpose, to get people away from these false concepts of God and back into the true uh, uh, character of God. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Monday's lesson. Uh, oh, go ahead. In this entire account, it is very, well, encouraging to me that after <clears throat> Adam and Eve had gone against God's will by succumbing to the devil's three lies, God could have said, that's it. That's it. But instead, he came looking for them. And I know when he, when he cried out that, Adam, where are you? It was like a father looking for his lost son, a parent looking for their lost child. It was a, it was a question given in a voice of love and mercy. Adam, where are you? And he's asking the same thing for all of us. Yeah, it's the same as, uh, it was the illustration of God looking for the sinner. No, he's looking for us. It's, it was with the prodigal. It says when the prodigal was a great while off, the father went forth. And that's what he does because up until that time, he always communed with them. And he comes this time, uh, and when he, I ain't gonna cuss. It was a quote I was gonna be for a second time. But when he came to them, he knew what they had done. What he was trying to get a confession on their part, because when we sin, he knows we sin, but he wants us to know. When we pray for forgiveness, we need to be specific about that thing we did, so we recognize it, or we that we know what we mm -hmm. did. So when we ask, it's an intelligent for us to forgive us, for him to forgive us of those things. Go ahead, Derek. Make it short. Make it short. Come on. Now. Okay. So back to what Pastor was just saying. Um, the next thing God asked them, they, they, they made the comment, we heard you coming in the garden. We were afraid, so we hid because we were naked. So God asked, well, who told you that? Who told you you were naked, right? Now, now you, you find that God is saying to them, in, a, in other words, John 3, 16 tell us, I'm sorry, 17, that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn so God, in that particular case, back in Genesis 3, is saying, I'm not condemning you. As you just said, I know your situation. I just need you to see it, right? Mm -hmm. So who told you you were naked? And I, I assume that there was a conversation from the enemy telling them that God was not be, uh, pleased with them because of what they've done. And so now they're afraid, but God was not condemning. You know, he, wasn't, he wasn't there to condemn them, but trying to bring them back into harmony with him again. Okay. Let's go to uh, Monday, on the run. Uh, turn, looking at Genesis, chapter 28, verse 13. I'm reading from the Amplified verse. I love this Bible. <laughs> it's the Amplified, and it goes, uh, verse 13, it says, And behold, the Lord stood above and around him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father's father and the God of Isaac I will give to you and to your descendants the land of promise on which you are lying behold I am with you and this is a promise he's speaking to us like he said behold I am with you and will keep careful watch over you and guard you wherever you may go I will bring you back to this promised land for I will not leave you until I have done what I promise you Amen. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. Would to God that we wake from our sleep. And he said, without any doubt, the Lord is in this place. And I did not realize it. How many of us have ever done that? We wake up and we see how the Lord has blessed us and been with us. 
in spite of what we've been doing. I'm the product. I'm, I'm like Paul. I'm the chief of sinners. I, I, I'm to, let me make a confession. I have gone to the depths of willful sin. We're going to talk about this later. In the sanctuary, there was no provision for willful sin. All the sins that was in there was for sins of ignorance. We're going to touch on that, but I don't want to get into that now. Uh, without any doubt, the Lord is in this place, and I did not realize it. So he was afraid and said, how fearful and awesome is this place. This is none other than what? The house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. What can we learn from this story about how God in Christ is seeking to reach us despite our sins? This is the question. Again, why must Christian education keep this principle at the forefront of what it teaches? Sin is our problem, and God is our solution. Christ is our solution, to be more specific. And without him, we can do nothing, but with him, all things are possible. It, I can look back in my eyes, I can never find a time where he disappointed me. Or when I really needed him, he was there for me. I'm the only one. <laughs> I'm the only one that ever kept my end. Even when I knew, I throwed him in the back. I, I'm telling you. And he loved, I'm going to tell you something. God loves me. He might love you. I know he loves me. He shows it to me every day. I just wanted to share that. All right, uh, let's go to Tuesday. Rabbi Jesus. It says, of all the chapter beginnings in the New Testament, none is more famous than this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's read some of this. As we're going to look at John 1, 1 through 14. Uh, again, I'm reading from the Amplified Version. I love this Bible. <laughs> In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the message. If we don't get nothing else, this is the message. It says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God, this word. All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that was coming to being. In him was life and the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men, his life. The light shines on in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it and is unreceptive to it. it says the light shines on in darkness and the darkness, wait, let me see. Uh, let me go to, there, there came a man commissioned and sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. This man came as a witness to testify about the light. The light was Christ's life, which lighted every man that comes into the world. I think, I think that's the next verse it says. Uh, there came sent from God whose name was John. This man came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe in Christ, the light through him, John the Baptist. John was not that light, but came to testify about that light. There it was, the true light, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light, which comes into the world and lightens everyone. He, Christ, was in the world, and through the world, was, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to, he came to that which is own, that which belonged to him, his world, his creation, his possession, and those who were his own people, the Jewish nation, did not receive him or welcome him, 
but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, rely on his name, who were born not of blood, natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, physical impulse, nor of the will of man, that of a natural father, but of God, that is divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and the word of Christ became flesh and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory, the glory as belongs to the one and only begotten of the Father, the Son, who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. That's our Savior. That is the word. So looking at this, it says that word, that word who was in the beginning became flesh. He became one with us. Let, you go with me to, uh, to Hebrews, the second chapter, just a couple of verses there. It says, uh, and I'm reading again from here. Therefore, since these his children share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same physical nature, but without sin, so that through experiencing death, he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Therefore, it is essential that he had to be made like his brethren. Had to do it. If he's going to be our savior, he had to go through what we went through. But he took it the next further. The Bible says he became man. But he didn't just become man. He took humanity and combined it with his holiness and brought it together in him. In him. That's the gospel. When John said the word became flesh and death among us, John's a prophet. This is going to have to happen in the end, in us. The word is going to have to become flesh in us, a living being through his Holy Spirit. This is when we study the word. Let me go to your text. Uh, I think it's in John 5. He says, it's the spirit that makes us alive. The flesh profit nothing. These words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So in order for us to become spiritual, we have to take that word. And that's where, <laughs> that's where the struggle lies. Us allowing that word to be a living thing in us. That's the warfare we go through. That's the song we sing, on with Christian soldiers marching off to war, the battle. For the mind, God wants our mind and Satan wants our mind. One of them's going to get it, but it's up to us to make that choice. But Christ did that in himself. I had to tell, I think it's Colossians. No, it's Ephesians, the second chapter, around 14 verses. He says the same thing. Uh, let me give you one more. For what the law could not do that what the law could not do that it has overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did send his own son in the likeness of sinful, in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh, subdued it, overcome it, overcame it in the person of his own son. The father did that so that the righteousness and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh, guided by worldliness and our sinful nature, but lives our lives in the ways of the spirit guided by his power. Uh, the same God who spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden and to Jacob in the middle of nowhere, now shows up as a person. God says the New Testament was personified in Jesus. Through Jesus, we can learn about God's will and God's way because Jesus was God. His life was the light of men. Anybody got anything on that? 
This chapter goes on to say how John the Baptist was so compelling a preacher that even religious leaders from Jerusalem suspected that he might be someone special. Let's go to, uh, here's a text. It's John 1, 29. John 1, 29. Remember when it says, John see Jesus coming, and what did he say? It's a lot in that. Behold him. Then he saw who he was and what he was going to do. How does he do that? How does he take away the sins of the world? Anybody? Well, let's take a little short journey into the sanctuary. Just a little short one. This is uh, in Leviticus, the fourth chapter. Uh, verse 27 to 31. There are many different sacrifices in there. We're going to look at the one where it says, when a common person sin. That's me. I'm just a common guy. And then we're going to, you'll see what Adam and Eve went through. It says, if any, of the, any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing any of the things the Lord has commanded, or it says in the King James, done somewhat against the commandments of the Lord that ought not to be done, and then what's the next says? Becomes guilty. So that's part of the process of the Lord coming in and doing this for you. You first, when it comes to your mind, you did this thing, you have to have guilt. You go through this process and there's no guilt. That's another whole conversation, but that's part of the salvation. And this is what Adam and Eve felt. They were hiding. They felt guilt. Guilt is a blessing. It's part, <laughs> it's part of that repentance. When it says repentance is a guilt, guilt, guilt is included in that. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to go. So you, you go through this process. This is what you had to go through first. And if his sin has if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, it comes to your memory that you did this thing because it was unintentional. It was something so. Then it says, then you will bring a goat, a female. This one says goat, the other one's a lamb, because he's talking about lamb. A female without blemish has his offering for the sin which he has committed. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, transferring symbolically his guilt and his sin to the sacrifice. Now here's something, and I got a confession. I didn't know, I mean, well, I didn't, I didn't, it drifted over me that the sinner cut the lamb's throat. I thought it was the priest. <laughs> All those times, I, I didn't see that, but now it makes so much sense. It says, he shall lay his hand on the sin offering and confessing his sins and his guilt was transferred. And it says, kill it in the place of the burnt offering. The sinner did that. That was supposed to do something to your human psyche. Your sin caused the death of that innocent victim. It's supposed to do something. So then you don't want to do that no more, right? <laughs> That's, this was the process that was supposed This was what the Lord intended. When you go back to the Jerusalem, they was like, you know, we can always say they, but we do the same thing. If they had a sacrifice, then it was okay. I got, I got a lamb over here. See what I'm saying? We do that, in a sense, because we know. Uh, and then it says, here's another part. Then the priest shall take some of his blood with his finger and put it on the horn of the altar, burnt offering, and shall pour it out the rest of the blood. Then, here's another part. Then he, not the priest, the sinner, shall remove all his fat. You had to cut it open and remove the fat. And you took that fat and handed it to the priest. The fat represented sin. And the priest took it and burned it on the altar and it became a sweet savor unto the Lord because it was sin burned. You had to do that process too. So when it's saying he taketh away the sin of the world, this is part of that process. When you see his love for you, and that your sin caused him to die. It's supposed to, so you don't want to do that thing no more. 
and he became the sin bearer, and he took it to Calvary. So that's, in a sense, how he does that. So when someone says, well, how does he take away our sin? So now you have a little <laughs> clearer understanding. That's the message he wants to get up. But then what did Christ say whenever he heals somebody? Go, because, oh, in that process, when you went through that and you walked away, not only your sins were forgiven, you were in a, as though you had never sinned. Your slate was right clean. Go and sin no more, lest the worst thing happen unto you. Remember that? So that's so, that's such a, how do we, why can't we, <laughs> and I'm saying, it's me. How come I can't grasp that thing? You know, so, again, if this gospel be here, it's here to them who are lost, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them so that the light of this gospel will shine unto them. Okay? Is that an excuse? <laughs> Is that an excuse? I don't know. Anyway, let me go on. Uh, oh, in Isaiah 53, 7. I'm just going to quote it. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open up his mouth or complain or defend himself like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like, like a sheep that is silent before a shearers. So he did not open up his mouth. And oppression and judgment was taken away. And as for his generation, who among them concerned himself with the fact that he was cut off from the land of the living by his death for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke of death was due? And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip the rest of that. So, as also two of John the Baptist followers decided to follow Jesus themselves, and when they asked what they were looking for, they called him rabbi. So Jesus is then a rabbi, a teacher, but never has there been a human teacher like him because, again, he is God. In other words, God came down to humanity in the form of a human being, and in that form he functioned as a rabbi a teacher. No wonder Ellen White calls him the greatest teacher the world has ever known. After all this, teacher was God. So considering who Jesus was, why does it make sense to learn from him the best ways of teaching spiritual truth? What can we learn from Jesus about why not only what we say is important for teaching, but also what we do? Uh, I had some, there was a, uh, did you know you can go to the General Conference website and click on archives and you can pull up Sabbath school lessons from the 1800s all the way up until now. And I have one from 75 and it was on the same thing, education. It's, it's good stuff in there, but for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to get into it. But you can do that. You can pull up not only Sabbath school lessons, all different things, it's there. It's free. You don't have to pay no money. There's no fee. You can print it up, and you can save it. It's a lot of good stuff in there. A uh, woman talks back. Let's go to Wednesday. How much time? I'm running out of time. Jesus is the master teacher. God's true character shines through his teaching and also in his life. So one gospel story is all the more remarkable for showing that when someone talks back to Jesus, he still listens. And it says, read that story. Anybody ever read that story about the woman who was consistent like blind Bartimaeus? She had a child that was sick and she needed help and she would not be denied. Uh, let me read this. Page. This is from the uh, this is from the E.G. White notes on the Sabbath school lesson. So I got I get it from him every quarter. It's really good. I'm just, so, uh, and we're talking about the woman, right? This is not the one. Okay, here I'm gonna read it. This is under uh, Wednesday, November six. It says Jesus knows the burden of every mother's heart. He who had a mother that struggle with poverty and privation, sympathizes with every mother in her labors. He who made a long journey in order to relieve the anxious heart of a Canaanite woman will do as much for the mothers of today. He who gave back to the widow of Nain her only son 
and in his agony upon the cross, remembered his own mother, is touched today by the mother's sorrow. In every grief, in every need, he will comfort and help. Let mothers come to Jesus with their perplexities. They will find grace sufficient to aid them in the care of their children. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burdens at the Savior's feet. He who said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, still invites mothers to bring their little ones to be blessed by him. That's from Ministry of Healing, page 42. And let um, me see. Not, skipping down, it says, not long before Herod, the puppet governor, <laughs> Jesus' home territory had executed John the Baptist. But John was a man whose vision Jesus largely shared. And the execution seems ominous. And Jesus had begun to come face to face with the danger of his mission. Uh, feeling the strain, Jesus entered into a house hoping so. Mark says in his account that no one would know he was there. And then this is when he came across the woman who again, like Brian Bartimaeus, would not be denied. And then skipping down, and then something remarkable happened. She didn't respond. She was familiar with dogs, unlike the Jews who would not have them as pets and said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master table. Her remarks makes a difference. It seems compelling. And Jesus hears a child. Mm -hmm. When I read this part of this um, lesson this week, where she was talking about the, um, the little dogs eating the crumbs, mm -hmm. I'm a dog person. And so when I read that part of the story, it made me think, okay, so sometimes the crumbs just don't fall. People that love their dogs will slip them something. So that's what she was, to me, that's what she is saying. I know something. you got something you can just slip to me. Give me some of them crumbs. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, my sister. Let's go to Thursday. A student who gets... Uh, uh, just a comment here. Oh, go ahead. I believe this story here is given to us because Jesus started out mm -hmm. acting like a Jew mm -hmm. that would not have accepted a person who was a Gentile. Mm -hmm. You know, she came to him, she asked for help. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, you know, it's, we don't do anything for dog, you know, the dogs and stuff like that. Anyway, I believe it's a very clear way of Jesus showing there should be no prejudice right. for anyone, no matter what their background or is. Yeah. Because no. there was prejudice here. They, you know, yeah. the Jews wouldn't have wanted her to come. And so that prepared the disciples for later on, recognizing they were to go to everyone, no matter what their background was. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was giving a very clear example of God loving everyone, mm -hmm. no matter what the background or whatever. Remember, remember the Samaritan woman at the well? Yes. When they came, they were well, talking to this woman. Right. You, we don't have no dealings with these That's right. people. You know, so yes, he was doing that also to teach them a lesson, you know? Right. That, the disciples needed to learn just like all of us do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, a along with that, um, Peter didn't get the message mm -hmm. right away, right? We find later on, when he had to go to Cornelius' house, that message came to him loud and clear. Right. That God was not a respecter of person, you know. But, he had, but Christ had to use that example back then to get that message across. So when it came to Peter later on in Acts, I know it just snapped. Why, this is what Christ told me? Yeah. This is an example he gave us way back with this Syrophoenician woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, it, sometimes with us, it takes a little time to learn the lessons. Yeah. But if we are constant, uh, consistent, we, we'll learn it. Yeah. And uh, as we grow, as a, as a quote that I was going to read later, as we grow closer in knowing him, we can begin to think. Because it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. We begin to think 
as he would think, where he, you know, we're allowing him to be a living part in our thoughts, everything. It talks about that in that quote. So we would, we would understand a lot better. We would understand his dealings with us. Uh, and disciples struggle with that a lot. You know, it's a lot of different things, like when the, when the bread, uh, fishes in the loaves, and he would say, you give them to eat. <laughs> they didn't like, what are you talking about? So I, I don't know. Let me, let me read, uh, uh, bring this up to the world. Okay, Jesus wanted above all things to bring hope to the world, but he was sure by now that those with the most power and privilege were going to do what they could do to nullify his mission. They dogged his step every way, but it was ultimately who? Satan. He has human, he uses the human, he used me. Uh, but whenever we saw opposition for everything he did, it was ultimately Satan. He would use anybody he can. So we need to, you know. Uh, when it says Herod was a puppet, <laughs> puppet governor. Okay. Uh, as for the inner circle of Jesus' students, the 12 disciples, they seem eager to be on Jesus' side, but at the same time, they seem baffled or blind. For example, Mark 8, 31, 33, the master teaches challenges the students to see things hard for them to see. That is, in many ways, they were still spiritually blind. That's what really mattered. Let me read that, 31, 33. And he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of me. Let me share something with you. Uh, I belong to this other fellowship, and we always talk about resentments and all of that. Were you having a problem? Were you angry with somebody, or you might even hate that individual? Let me get you in a little seat. And this is what Christ said. You need to look past them and see that power that's working in them that sometimes they themselves are not aware of. And it's not them that you hate or sick or tired. It's that enemy behind. Only when I started looking at it that way, it was more better. So then when Christ says, and I still struggle with that, he says, do good for them that despitefully use. If he's turned the other cheek, if he did to give them your cloak also and all that. So when you start looking at it that way, it's not that individual. It's the power that's behind them they're making. I just wanted to share that. That helped me a lot. I don't walk around, I don't, again, the other fellowship. You walking around angry, that person could be on the other side of town. They don't know, <laughs> they don't know you, <laughs> what you're going through. So who's really has the problem? I don't, and so they told me, don't give them the power to rent space in your brain and they're not even around. So I, I don't do that no more. I think I get past that. I just want to share that a little bit with you. Uh, I'm still over here. Let me get back. All right. Uh, let's go to Bartimaeus. We got a couple more minutes. Bartimaeus. And he, as, as Jesus went on, the two, this, the, the two blind men followed him because he talked about that. Uh, the two blind men followed him screaming loudly, have mercy and compassion on us, son of David, the Messiah. And when he went into the house, the blind men came up to him. And Jesus said to them, do you believe with the deep abiding trust that I am able to do this. That's that faith. We have to have that. Because without that, he can do nothing in us. He's powerless to save us or do his miracles if we don't believe it. He can't do it, even if he wanted to. It takes you cooperating or you surrendering or you, whatever that process is. It says, they said to him, yes, Lord, then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, your trust, and confidence in my power and my ability to heal, it will be done unto you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows this. But they went out and spread the news about 
throughout that whole region. And here's another one. So it says that they can finally see. Uh, let's go to Revelation. It's in uh, chapter 3, verse 17 to 20. This is the one uh, in the message to the Laodiceans. It says, because you, are, you say I am rich and prospered and grown wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, without hope and in great need. I counsel you to buy of me gold that has been heated red hot and refined by fire so that you may become truly rich, rich and white robes representing the righteousness, representing righteousness to clothe you so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? They sold fig leaves and healing salve or eye salve to put on your eyes that you may see finally. And those who I dearly and tenderly love, I rebuke and chase and showing them their faults and instructing them. So be, so be the door of the church and continue. So wait a minute. I rebuke and discipline showing them their faults and instructing them. So be enthusiastic and repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior, seek God's will. Behold, I stand at the door of the church. You hear that? And continually knocking. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with him and restore him. And he with me, because he says anyone, it doesn't have to be the pastor. Anybody, open the door. Uh, Bartimaeus had wanted to see the curl and the baby's hair and the color of wheat at harvest. But seeing includes more than just what's physical only. This story, in other words, is about seeing spiritually. It's about getting it and about catching on to what the master teacher is truly all about. Physical sight is one thing. It's an important thing, and Jesus knows it. But Jesus also knows that every person's deepest wish is for a new and better life. When he asked Bartimaeus, he said, Lord, I just want to see. The test of discipleship. Let me read this. We made it to Friday. <laughs> That's our sin. Let me, let me read this. This is uh, in the chapter, The Test of Discipleship. It's on page 62. It's just a couple paragraphs. Let me read it. The condition of eternal life is now just what it has always been. Just what it was in paradise before the fall of our parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. If eternal life is granted or anything short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way should be open for sin and with all its train of war and misery to be immortalized. It was possible, listen to this. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen, and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful, unholy, and cannot perfectly obey the law, we have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. This is the good news. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us, and now he offers to take our sins, the sin bearer, and gives us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, listen to this, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteousness. This is righteousness by faith. If we believe that. Sinful as your life may have been, and I was there, we are accounted righteousness on his behalf, because we all bad. Uh, so what's this quote? It says, it's in heavenly places. It says, when it's in the heart to do God's will, and efforts are put forth in this direction. I mean, you got to really try. You make up your mind, you're going to serve him, then you're going to really try. She says, God accepts this as man's best service, and he makes up for his deficiency through the righteousness of Christ. So 
from that point on by your faith. When God looks down, he don't see the sinner. He sees him covered with the life of his son. That's what righteousness by faith is, and that's what he does for me. <laughs> he might do it for you. I, I know he does it for me. I, anyway, I got, I got to get this part because we got to close here. Uh, he offers to take our sin and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him, accept him as your savior, then simple as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you have not sinned. Listen to this. More than this, more than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith, and you are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So you may say, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, let me pray. Loving Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you if we go into the next part of the service. You bless the speaker of the hour. Bless the hearers. Bless those that are coming. Be with us. Bless these household represented. Bless this service. Bless this church. We ask these mercy in thy dear son's name. For his sake we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming out. Those online too, thank you.